Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're going to be talking about Virginia's nurse practitioners. Joining me is Dr. Rebecca Bates, who is a nurse practitioner with a lot of other initials behind her name, who is also the region president here in Northern Virginia for the Virginia Council of Nurse Practitioners. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me today. So you have a lot of initials behind your name, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to being a doctor. Um, I would love to know sort of your journey from deciding you wanted a career in healthcare to where you are now and sort of all of the steps along the way that brought you there. Okay. I will gloss over some of the steps because it's okay. been a long journey. <laughs> so my first degree was actually in English literature. And I, what I found about English Lit was that I really loved the human connection and the human persona, right? And understanding why people do what they do. And I married my husband, who is active duty Army, and we ended up in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And there was a nursing school close to my home, and my um, friend asked if I would like to try nursing school, and so I did. And I fell in love with my first day of nursing school. I said, this is what I need to be doing. This is experiencing the human condition. From there, I worked in a variety of settings, um, mainly um, inpatient for a little bit in medical surgical, but I also worked in inpatient oncology. And what I found is most of the patients that we were treating in oncology had preventable cancers. And I knew then that I had to be a nurse practitioner to work only in primary care so I could help prevent those types of cancers. Along the journey to becoming a nurse practitioner, then I also realized that chronic diseases were prevalent. I knew as a nurse that a lot of the people that we took care of in the hospital were there and they shouldn't have been. They should have had healthcare access somewhere along the way. But the chronic disease management piece is something that we take for granted in this country. You know, we go see our healthcare provider and they tell us to lose weight or take this medicine and we're like, I'll get to it someday. So true. Right? <laughs> I'm but, guilty. Yeah. Okay. And me too. But it's a little hard sometimes to, you know, go back home and keep up with those things. So right now, I work for a free clinic. I run the Adams Compassionate Healthcare Network. Um, I'm the clinician that's there during the week, and I have an administrator, and I have a front desk person, and I have a social worker. And the four of us care for a patient panel of almost a thousand people. Wow. Um, and then I also have a number of students, and they're all nursing students, advanced practice students, uh, doctor of nursing practice students, family nurse practitioner students, community health, um, public health students, and together we really provide uh, wraparound services for our patients. We navigate them into the care they need. We provide primary care services exclusively, but if they need help with housing or they need help with finding a job or they need help with English language classes, we can also help them with those things. And then, of course, getting them into additional health care services, maybe um, specialty care services that we don't provide in the clinic. So that's my primary placement. Um, but I've also worked for the community services boards over in Prince William County as part of the George Mason University Mason and Partners Clinics. And in the community services boards, we provided primary care health services to people with serious mental illness or substance use disorder who had no insurance and who had no other access to care. And through that, I gained a real appreciation for, for people living with substance abuse and people that had mental illness that really needed high touch care. High touch care means that you're frequently connecting with them, giving them support so that they continue taking their medication, continue engaging in therapy, and continue getting the things they need. And that's critical, for, and I think we have failed to understand that throughout mm -hmm. this opioid crisis. You can't right. just go to rehab, put people back in their community without support, back in their home without Absolutely. support, and expect them, you know, to be successful in their recovery. Right. But, you know, health care in this country, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, is fraught with all kinds of issues, one of them being having adequate access to health care, having an adequate number of professionals to deliver health care where it's needed, exactly. when it's needed. Mm -hmm. So two things happened last year. Uh, we got Medicaid expansion, right. which put 300,000 Virginians on the rolls to get health care. Right. Um, and then nurse practitioners got a greater practice authority mm -hmm. um, through the legislature. And I really, and it's something I championed because I do believe that all of these things are tied together. More people who need health care require more health care providers. And a lot of that providing health care is in remote areas where there are not established clinics. Mm -hmm. some, some counties in Virginia have no hospitals. Right. You know, some people are getting their health care once a year on the fairgrounds in Wise County from the Ram Clinic. So how do we provide adequate preventative wellness as well as, you know, diagnostic kinds of services mm -hmm. unless we have an adequate number of, of health care professionals? So, 
describe a little bit about the Greater Practice Authority and what this has mm -hmm. meant and what it will mean going forward. Right, so as you said, in 2019, in January of 2019, uh, nurse practitioners in the state of Virginia who had five or more years of experience, that equates to 9,000 hours of more of experience as a nurse practitioner, were allowed to apply for an autonomous license. Autonomous license is not full practice authority. It's autonomy. It means that you no longer need a collaborative physician. Up until January of last year, about half of us in Virginia um, were, were eligible for autonomous practice. Um, but up until January, all NPs in Virginia had to have a collaborative provider. And a collaborative physician, what they would do is sign their name to a piece of paper that they would collaborate with us, and they would have to review a certain number of charts a month. They didn't have to work at our same practice site. They didn't ever have to eyeball our patients. They did have to be available by telephone or some other method if we needed them. But that was it. And so a lot of times our collaborators were signing off on a form or reviewing a chart for somebody that they had never met or evaluated themselves. There are 23 states in the country that have full practice authority where there is no oversight needed. I used to work in Rhode Island. That was one of them. I worked in Rhode Island as a brand new nurse practitioner, and I did not need a collaborative or supervisory agreement like was required in Virginia. So now in the state of Virginia, we have 8,100 nurse practitioners, and half of us are eligible for, for, for autonomous practice. So far, since January of last year, we have almost 700 of us that have our autonomous licenses, and every day that's growing. It's a simple application. It's a two-page application. You just have to have your former collaborator sign off that you have had five years of experience or 9,000 hours. You send it to the Board of Nursing with a one-time $100 fee, and they issue you a license to practice autonomously. This is big because in some of the rural and underserved areas, you have to try to find a physician that is willing to collaborate with you, and if you can't, then you are not allowed to practice. Right, even if you're willing to give away your services, you exactly. can't practice. Exactly, exactly. So um, my, my clinic is part of the Virginia Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. There are 40 such clinics in the state, and I, we were talking earlier that some people just want to volunteer at the free clinics, and they can't unless they have a collaborative agreement. So this autonomous license allows us to go out and practice wherever we see the need. And we know that nurse practitioners, according to Peter Bierhaus's study from, I believe, 2011, said that NPs are more likely to work in rural and underserved areas within five years of a state issuing autonomous practice than in states that have restricted licensors. So we have nurse practitioners that are working in southwestern Virginia that have their own practices that now have plenty of experience. They no longer have to have that collaborative physician, which means that they're protecting health care in their own communities that they came from. It's not just the, the health wagon um, providing services once a year uh, at the Wise Ram Clinic or up and down uh, Appalachia. It's permanent structure clinics run by solo NPs who are practicing to the full extent of their education and training. And that's so necessary. And my friend Lori Buckwald has her own practice in Radford, Virginia. And just, mm -hmm. that was really my introduction to what this whole model looked like, which is there was a fee paid to the mm -hmm. collaborative physician, which kind of hit a business model if you had your own independent practice, right? right? Right. And then the other thing is physicians were limited to how many they could supervise. So if Correct. they were at their max of like six, six. nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. then they couldn't take any more. Right. And so it was just hampering the entire healthcare system as far as mm -hmm. access, adequate access for the people who needed services to the people who could provide them. Right. So that was a real victory. Yeah. Access to care isn't just about having insurance so that you can go and get care. It's about having somebody that is able to care for you, it, that is willing to care for you, and somebody that you can get to or that you can access. So in my clinic and a lot of other places, we use telehealth to help access patient yes. care. Right? And so for my patients that are uninsured, a lot of them also have transportation issues. Right. And so we are able to connect with them via telehealth so that they can be at their home, because we don't take insurance, so we don't have to be beholden to a, a hub-and-spoke model, but we can connect with patients at home. So say somebody has diabetes, instead of having them come in so I can look at their blood sugar log and talk to them about healthy eating, we can do the same thing via telehealth. They get that frequent touch, they get um, any medications that they need refilled, any labs they need ordered, I can do right via telehealth as well. But we have that connection, so I can visualize them, I can see them, they can see me, and we can talk just like you and I are doing. And like many of us communicate with our families and friends anyway, right? True, and I mean, and that's meeting people where they are. And transportation is a problem in the most underserved populations in the Commonwealth of Virginia, right. including rural Virginia. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem in rural Virginia is broadband. You're excellent. You know, so, right. there's so, so there's so many interconnecting parts to mm -hmm. all of this delivering quality health care to the right. maximum number of people across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so the Virginia Council of Nurse Practitioners, which has been around, I think, since 1974, 
Yeah. Yeah, since 1974. You know, that organization exists to support nurse practitioners. Correct. Um, and so they have a legislative agenda every year. And right. so this was on the legislative agenda last year. Mm -hmm. um, for this year, what are what is the, the VCNP looking to do? So this year, the VCNP is supporting a bill that would allow um, preceptors. So NPs go through their didactic courses, and we have a clinical component. And all NPs complete at least 500 hours of clinical component as an NP um, before they can graduate. And you need a preceptor to do that. 80% of NPs are primary care. So we are not working in the hospital. So these are not the same rotations that many of us do as RNs. These are preceptors in the community. We don't get paid. Our physician colleagues get paid for precepting medical students in their practices. Nurse practitioners do not. So this bill would offer us a tax credit if you, uh, if you take on an NP student for a certain number of hours per year, you can have a tax credit for that. And that's a start, that's a step in the right direction. It doesn't fix the problem, but it certainly helps to alleviate and hopefully increase the pool of people who are willing to be preceptors. You know, and you, and you bring up something else too, and that's how do we, healthcare is one of the, the fastest growing fields for which there are jobs, lots of jobs at all right. levels. But, you know, inducing people to not just to go into nursing, but to take that extra step to become a nurse practitioner because we need more of them. Mm -hmm. So having these hurdles where there's an expense related to it or difficulties, any of these difficulties that create a hurdle limit the number of people we're able to actually, you know, educate to be nurse practitioners. Correct. Correct. And the other thing is subspecialties. And mm -hmm. And I didn't realize you were talking about, I, I, I know about, the, so there's a family nurse practitioner, mm -hmm. you were talking about a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. Correct. I, I'm imagining there's all kinds of subspecialties. Sure, yeah, so there are multiple subspecialties. So family nurse practitioners are the largest group. Um, we also have, like you said, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners. We have acute care nurse practitioners. We have adult gerontology nurse practitioners. We have uh, pediatric nurse practitioners, neonatal nurse practitioners. So we kind of run the gamut. In the state of Virginia, the other groups that are considered nurse practitioners are, are um, clinical nurse midwives and uh, um, certified registered nurse anesthetists. So these are NPs who deliver uh, anesthesia and of course we know what midwives do. Yeah. We deliver babies and provide uh, women's health care services. Well, this is fascinating. And when we come back from our break, I'm going to ask you some more about some of these specialties and how it helps to serve the people in our community. So. Please join us after this break. We are talking about nurse practitioners here in Virginia. Today I'm going to talk to you about physics. Come on in, girls. Let's go. This is the first rocket to get humans to Mars. Really tall. I'm a rocket structural engineer designing and building parts of the rocket. You are the generation that will be stepping foot on Mars. Do I have a group of astronauts on my hands? Yes. You can become a rocket scientist or whatever else you want to be. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. Mom! I got it. What are you doing in there? I got stuck. Are you a dog? I wouldn't do that. Have you seen the pliers? Where'd you find those? It's not your birthday. Sorry. Bye, Grandpa. Bye, Grandpa! Take care of yourself. What are you doing? What are you looking for?
Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and today we're talking about Virginia's nurse practitioners. And joining me is Dr. Rebecca Bates, who is the Northern Virginia Region President for the Virginia Council of Nurse Practitioners. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you again. So, healthcare is multifaceted. Um, nurse practitioners are multifaceted. And so, all of us are probably thinking in terms of nurse practitioners as clinicians but there's actually a lot more to that. And you are actively involved as a project manager for something called Mason Unite. Correct. So nurse practitioners affect healthcare at all different levels, right? We interface with people one-on-one. -on -one. We work as educators. So I'm on faculty at ODU in the graduate program. So I teach uh, the health policy and business class and population health class. Um, because of that and because of my experience working at the Community Services Board that I ta talked to you about before, I was asked to be a project manager for a, a HRSA grant. And this HRSA grant works in two sites in Northern Virginia that are primary care sites where we do universal screening for depression. It means everybody that comes through the door gets uh, screened for depression. People who are identified as having symptoms of depression will see the primary care provider for that. If that diagnosis of depression is made, they'll be offered the opportunity to participate in collaborative care. What that means is a care manager will follow up with them every two weeks to provide a rescreening, to provide high touch care, meaning they'll call them and ask how they're doing, are they taking their medication, are they seeing their therapist, is there something else going on that might be making them feel better or worse now, and then reporting back to primary care. The Patient still sees primary care provider for their regular care and for medication prescribing if needed, um, but they have this extra point of contact that helps them uh, get better faster. Our studies have shown that we have reduced in the, one of the clinics that we're working in where we've reduced time and treatment from over 600 days to less than 200 days, which is amazing. It is remarkable, so. and, it's, and it's remarkable too that it's, it's not necessarily a standard of care that Perfect. all patients are screened for depression. Right, absolutely. I know that I have interviewed Bassam Khan of, of Neighborhood Health, who's mm -hmm. the executive director, and he says all the patients that come to their clinics, mm -hmm. all of them are screened for depression, right. which I thought was remarkable at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and then it makes you wonder, well, why wouldn't every patient who ever sees a primary care physician be screened in the same manner? Because our mental health definitely impacts physical health. Absolutely, yeah, so in, in healthcare, sometimes we separate the brain and the body, right? But did you know that people who attempt suicide, 50% have seen a healthcare provider within the last month? No, I did not know that. So that staggering, that staggering statistic alone should help us remember that we have to be vigilant as healthcare providers. And we have to teach our students to be as well so that they will learn the correct way to um, address patients and to assess patients and diagnose patients. Um, the other part of the collaborative care model is that we utilize a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner to help support the primary care provider in recognizing those behavioral health issues and helping them to better uh, choose the right treatments in terms of medication and and psychotherapy as needed. So it really is a collaborative environment. The great thing about this is it has so much research behind it, more than 80 randomized controlled trials to support it, that it is a reimbursable service, meaning if we were not instituting this in a free clinic, we could get reimbursed for this service. So more and more, um, we're finding that nurse practitioners are working in areas where we're testing out new models of care so that we can expand that to other areas and really do the best job that we can for the patients that come to us. And you know, and you and so you're doing you're doing clinical work, you're teaching, right. you're doing research work through this grant. Right. You know that that it provides such a spectrum of ways in which, again, you're impacting healthcare, not just in one way, but Absolutely. in numerous ways. Right, and so it's really a barrier to being able to try out these new models of care and to try and think of new ways to approach patient care when rules and regulations such as a required collaborative practice agreement put those barriers in our way. You can't practice because your physician doesn't want you to do it that way or because re uh, insurance won't reimburse you for that particular way, right? So what we're doing with telehealth in my clinic, insurance wouldn't reimburse that because the patient is at home. They're not right. at another healthcare facility. Well, we're doing that because our patients don't have access to another healthcare facility, right? right? So we can test that and say, you know what, this model really works. We can take that data then and share it with you know, our lawmakers and say, we need to change these rules because this is the model that works when we can connect with our patients at the time and the place that they're choosing that makes sense for them. And I think tele telehealth may be the next big leap forward. For some areas of Virginia. Yeah, it, it really right. is. So Southwest Virginia, and I was born and raised in Southwest Virginia. And mm -hmm. 
and it's rural and they don't have broadband. There's just a lot of hurdles. You know, it's it, the people live in very remote places. It's not easy for them to get to a clinic if it even existed. Mm -hmm. So you've got a student who's actually doing work down in that area. I do. I have a colleague who owns her own practice down there. Um, it's called Everheart Primary Care. And Carol and her mother started that, that practice a number of years ago while they were DNP students, in fact. Um, and they, they started that practice, they grew that practice, and now I have a student working with Dr. Everhart, Carol Everhart, at that clinic. And Alex is working with people with hypertension, with high blood pressure. Because there is no cellular service available and no broadband access to the clinic, instead of utilizing telehealth, he's picking up the phone and calling patients about their hypertension and asking them what their blood pressure readings are. Are they taking their medicine? He's also asking them if they're uh, working on smoking cessation. And so he's helping them set goals and then following up with them on a regular basis, using that high-touch care in a patient registry, similar to collaborative care, to really help that population of patients improve. So that's what I mean when I say that we can think of new models of care. We can test out new ways of doing things and see what works in an area and see what, work, what doesn't work in an area. This is not less than standard of care. This is in addition to standard of care. And nurse practitioners are really good at health promotion and disease prevention following evidence-based practice guidelines. You know, and, and you're right. We need to explore every avenue for delivering health care services, whether it's by telephone or telehealth. But going back to some old-fashioned practices, mm -hmm. home health visits is not something we do here, but mm -hmm. it's been done in Europe. So my grandson was born in, in Poland six months ago mm -hmm. in Warsaw. And in the UK and in countries like Poland, mm -hmm. a nurse comes like within six days after you've had this baby and, right. and then they check on how the mother's doing and mm -hmm. again talking about just the overall is the mom coping okay, mm -hmm. how's the baby doing and we don't do that here. Right. No, those are usually reserved for special populations. Um, when I was a nursing student in southwest Oklahoma, we had visiting nurses, but that was a funded program for nurses from the health department to go out and do mother-baby checks. And so that's not widespread. And you're right, many nurses are not able to practice to the full extent of their education and training because of barriers, reimbursement, legal reasons. Exactly. And even when we know that there is a, a proven evidence-based model of health care that works, mm -hmm. sometimes it's just a matter of accepting that as a standard of practice. You know, and, and that's one we don't have as a standard of practice, even though other countries do it. And, and we struggle with our maternal and infant mortality rates. And, right. and then you wonder, but I agree with you, being able to actually test these in a model and mm -hmm. say we, got, we have data to show effectiveness, whether it's reducing depression or blood pressure. Right. And, in, and again, in Southwest Virginia, part, part of it is chronic disease. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. and helping people to manage that so that mm -hmm. they're healthier. Right, right. So one of the things that we do need is we need to have more clinical faculty to be able to educate our nurses and our nurse practitioners. So throughout the country, there is a shortage of nurse, nursing faculty, not just nurse practitioner faculty, but nursing faculty, so much so that 50,000 qualified applicants a year are turned away from nursing programs. That's amazing, so 50,000 candidates. 50,000 candidates. So if we don't have nurses, we can't grow nurse practitioners because all nurse practitioners have to be nurses first. You have to be a registered nurse before you can can become a nurse practitioner. Wow, so we need faculty to teach, to actually teach these courses. Absolutely. You know, and I think to myself, you know, healthcare has been identified as one of the fastest growing um, fields for people to find living wage jobs. Right. And in Virginia, we have 23 community colleges spread yeah. out, but I don't even know what programs are offered in those community colleges. And again, mm -hmm. where do you find the faculty to actually teach? healthcare programs in all of those different places. Right, so some of that may be exploring some additional uh, distance learning options and doing local clinicals. Um, my husband is active duty, so we've lived all over. He was stationed at Fort Drum, New York when I was doing my nurse practitioner degree. There were no nurse practitioner programs in Fort Drum, New York, I assure you, but there were nurse practitioners there. So I did a distance learning program where I got online to do my didactic course and interface with my faculty in St. Louis, Missouri, and I did my practicum in town at a federally qualified health center, at a cardiac center, at a primary care clinic. So I had a fabulous experience working with a rural population, hands-on, got all my hours in, had exposure to lots of different models of care. We can do the same thing for NPs anywhere, NP students anywhere, and RN students. It's about building that, that clinical base within your community and figuring out the needs of the community and how best to teach people to care for the needs of their community. And that sounds like the model. The model that you, that you experienced personally is Correct. a model that could be replicated in lots of places. Right. Distance learning 
with the practical, hands-on clinical experience. Absolutely, with funding for adequate funding for faculty as well as for preceptors. Because like me, most of my, pay, my students that I take on, I don't get paid for any of them. This is in addition to me running the clinic and seeing my patients, I also manage my student population, which means being in the room with them to, to reassess somebody, confirming their diagnosis, um, making sure their charting is correct, doing all of their midterm and final evaluations. I don't get paid for any of that. That's a lot of extra time and effort no that kidding. we're asking our practicing clinicians to donate to the service of their profession. So we really do need a reimbursement um, mechanism and a tax credit is the way, is a step in the right direction. It's not gonna fix the problem, but it's a step. And, and that brings us full circle back to the Virginia Council of Nurse Practitioners whose 2020 conference is March 4th to the through the 7th in Correct. Norfolk, Correct. and this association exists mm -hmm. to support nurse practitioners, obviously. Right. They set a legislative agenda that mm -hmm. removes some of these hurdles Correct. or seeks resources for some of the things that you're talking about doing mm -hmm. to make it easier for nurse practitioners, first of all, to create more of them and to deploy them where they're needed in Virginia. Absolutely, it's also an opportunity for us to get together and share ideas, share about what we're doing in our own clinics and then learn from others what they're doing in their practices. And then also, of course, to keep up to date with all the clinical practice guidelines and procedures and those kinds of things as well. And, and I'm a big believer in that. I mean, that's what professional associations are for. It, it helps, it creates a peer to peer sharing and it also disseminates information. And how many, you did tell me how many nurse practitioners there are in Virginia? There are more than 8,100 in Virginia. Um, but because nurse practitioners also include our midwife colleagues and our CRNA colleagues, we actually have over 11,600 um, designated NPs. Right. Right. And, and there are subspecialties in those, and that's, mm -hmm. again, so there are some areas where we need more specialists. Gerontologists is one where there's very right. few people who go into gerontology. Right, so gerontology and behavioral health services, so our psych mental health colleagues, psych mental health clinical nurse specialists, psych mental health nurse practitioners, we really need more of them to be able to provide behavioral health therapies. And this is a good career. Absolutely, it is a fabulous career. We can transport across state lines. Every time I move, I'm eligible to get a license in another state. It is fabulous to be able to work with our patients and our new nurse practitioners and our students. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate thank it. You. And appreciate for it. those of you at home, this is what you need to know about Virginia's nurse practitioners. We need more of them, and they are busy out there providing the best quality health care to Virginians across the entire Commonwealth.